Good morning and welcome to our weekly study of Second Peter. So glad you have joined me here in this auditorium as well as those who are online. Appreciate your participation in studying the Word of God together. This morning I like to start with the verse 8 of 2 Peter chapter 3. So if you have your Bible, uh, please open that Bible to the third chapter of 2 Peter. We start with the verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Let us pray. Father, we are so grateful to come together and study your word. Holy Spirit, open our eyes and open our understanding. You be the instructor this morning. Bless our time together. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Apostle Peter, wrapping up this chapter, his letter, this is the last words of Peter he is giving to the uh, church. So it is fascinating. We looked at these three chapters, which has three major uh instruction Peter is trying to give. And they are, chapter one, he talked about the believers should have the assurance of their salvation. Be sure, be certain that you are saved. You are a child of God. You are a believer. Secondly, in his time, he was talking about false teachers and false prophets will come. And then the third, the major doctrine about <clears throat> the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, those people, they were mockers. They were denying that truth. So as Peter approaching his last days here on the face of the earth. Jesus told him in John's Gospel 21, you're going to be crucified. So he knows he's going to die. So he is coming and writing his last letter as a pastor, as a leader, and he is writing his letters to the believers. Don't fall for the denial of the second coming by the Lord Jesus Christ like the scoffers or the mockers. They will come. 2,000 years is passed by. And you know, even today, people are thinking, when is he coming? What happened to the coming he has promised? So doubts and questions being injected in the minds of people. So they are saying, Peter is saying, no, I want you to be assured of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he gave an argument. We looked at the first uh, few verses we saw. The mockers used their argument. Don't believe. Don't believe the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So trying to emotionally appeal to those believers 
at that time. And they said, uh, this is a joke. They were scoffing. They were mocking. They were making fun of it. It doesn't mean a thing. Then it was morally, it was impacting them. That's the reason they said he is not coming. If the doctrine of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ means judgment, that means their conduct and behavior must be pure in the sight of God. So they said, hey, listen, we're going to live the way we want. We're going to please the flesh. Our fleshly desires and the appetites, we're going to follow that. So they conjectured this idea, second coming is not coming. If second coming is not coming, that means there is no judgment. If there is no judgment, means we don't have to be accountable to anybody. We don't have to be accountable to God so they can live any way they want, and that was the case. Then finally, that's what we looked at, the counter argument by Peter. Finally, he said, look at our ancestors who has died. Now, they did not experience any judgment. They deliberately forgot the Noah's time. And we looked at that aspect of uh, Noah's time, what happened. The water that was separated by God. We saw the water, the entire universe, the cosmos, was full of water. Some kind of chaotic condition has already taken place. So on the day two, we saw God appeared on the scene and he had to, like, almost like taking a knife and cutting the water into half. The half of the water stayed above the firmament or the sky or the heavens and half of the water below the sky or the firmament. And we called the, the waters on the third day. That was here on the land. He said, gather in the seas. Thus we have the seas, oceans, uh, rivers, and lakes, and so forth. So water was all. However, on the second day, he created the water that was above. We saw that became a judgment source for God when he used that during Noah's time. We saw not only the deep part of the earth open up and the water came up, also God opened the windows of heaven and the water from above started coming. Now imagine the, the, the peak of the Himalayas, and you talk about the tallest mountain of this earth has been covered with the water. And if you uh, go to Arizona, is the, where, where is the uh, Grand Canyon? Is it in Arizona? Where is it? It is. Okay, forget the state, Grand Canyon. If you look at it, you can see the plates of uh, rocks being piled such a way. You can see the uh, signs and wonders of the flood that has impacted. So you know it has happened. So he is reminding them, you remember what happened. Now, after he showed, you deliberately ignored the judgment of God during Noah's time, and now he is taking two more arguments. I alluded to this last week toward the tail end of our section. So which is, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Now, that is an important aspect of Peter's argument. Now he's saying a day. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. So that is important. So as I was looking at it, 
I don't know whether I can say prophetically what was stated in Genesis 1 was the intent Peter using here. I think the reason he used this reference here to give the impression to God in the eternity, time doesn't mean. To us, to us, the day is equal to what? 24 hours. Yes? And to God, it's a thousand years, it seems to him, like a day. So it doesn't mean anything. So it is that short. However, it is important to notice one thing. This is the one thing, uh, you know, when you read uh, the scriptures, I start noticing certain things are omitted. Uh, I want you to see this, Genesis chapter 1 for a minute. I want you to look at, we're talking about the day. If you turn with me to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, end of verse 3, uh, 5, I should say. Look at this way he is concluding day 1. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Uh, Same chapter, verse eight. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Uh, Same chapter, verse 13. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. Same chapter, verse number 19. There was evening and there was morning, fourth day. And same chapter, verse 23. There was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. Verse number 31, same chapter. God saw... All that he had made, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Look at chapters two. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God has finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. What was the thing was missing on the seventh day? The evening and the morning, the seventh day. If you notice very carefully, and I believe in my heart That was intentionally placed in there to prove one thing. The six days of God's work, on the seventh day he rested. Six days of man's 24 hours day came. But it came on the seventh day. The rest of God was not limited by 24 hours. It does not say it when he said it. So sometimes the omission of certain things. I read this. I I have studied this, but it did not click until early this morning. I reread this and it clicked. It said, on the seventh day, it does not say the evening and the morning. And I believe the reason for that is God put in a seed form a prophetic timeline, prophetic timeline, which is six days God worked. On the seventh day he rested. He called that as a holy because the six days, according to Peter, we just read, to God one day is equal to thousand years 
and thousand years is equal to one day. So when you look at the time span, Adam, Father Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years have completed. That is equal to two days. From Isaac, the son, to the Jesus Christ, the son of God, is another 2,000 years. So when Christ was appeared here on the face of the earth, from Adam to his appearance, B.C. 3 or 4, at that time, nearly 4,000 years have completed. <coughs> that means we have four days of days are completed. If we apply the principle what Peter said here. Also, same reference, you can see in Psalm 90. Who wrote Psalm 90? Moses. Moses wrote Psalm 90. And Moses is the one who gave us the account of what? Six days God worked. On the seventh day he rested. So let's come back. So now you have Adam to Jesus. You have, I wanted to put this on a slide to put it there, but I didn't have the time to. So listen to this. Adam to Jesus, 4,000 years. Then Christ came, he died, and he was crucified, he's resurrected, and he has taken up. So from after he was seated on the right-hand side of the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit here on the earth. Now we have the work of the Holy Spirit is continuing, and we're in the 2,000 some time, okay? That is an another two days. Are you with me? I hope you're following me. So you have Father Adam to Father Abraham, 2,000 years. Son Isaac to Son Jesus Christ, another 2,000. So Father, Son, now the third 2,000 years is the work of the Holy Spirit. All three, the Trinity, is at work from the very beginning. Father, Son, and now we are in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. He is at work. Now what we see is we're going to come to an end of this day, end of this sixth day. Then what happens? One day of the day of the Lord is come to a place is called the God's rest, which is most theologians teach there are a millennial period is going to come. When Christ comes here on the earth, there will be a 1,000 year period is called the millennium. That will be a complete rest for God's people. I, I, I don't know. I, I wanted to get excited, but I realize I'm on camera here. So let me, let me behave. Okay. You, you're talking about the six days of the rest. No beginning, no evening, no morning is mentioned because that is in eternity. God's rest is obviously given to us. And the seventh day rest was precisely given to us and calling God's rest upon the face of the earth. And that is that day. And he said, to that day, it is in eternity, time is very short, however, for God. But we are the one struggling. Oh, how long is it going to be? We would like to see Christ returning now, especially all the activities that's going on now. We're surrounded by so many different activities. It's, oh, Lord, come quickly, take us. We don't want to go through this. But I'm telling you, God is on schedule. He is coming. That is very 
precise. So he just finished telling, Peter just finished telling, a day is equal to thousand years. Thousand years is like a day to God. Then the next verse, verse 9, he said, the Lord is not slow. Hey, just because it's been a long period of human thinking and human mind, he is saying, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. That means slow, that means God is not late. God is not late and he's keeping his promise. He is faithful and true. God never lies. If he says he's going to send his son, you can bet, you can count on it. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is 100% sure that he will come again for the people that God has redeemed. And he said, and some understand slowness instead. So now he is inserting, please do not equate the delay of the Lord is some kind of indifference or incompetence. It is not anything like that, but it is a unique characteristics of God. That's what Peter is saying. He is saying, instead, God is patient, patient with you, notwithstanding anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The only reason God should delay is because in his heart's desire is none should perish, all should be saved, and he is waiting for that. When we looked at the Noah's time, and 120 years Noah was preaching, and what happened, only eight people got saved, and there, God is still waiting for people's repentance. But may I say this to you? There is a time going to come, God is going to call it, enough is enough. Hello? Enough is enough. And people are destined to live 60 years. God counted that day, it's going to come to an end. Hopefully, they have repented by then. Some live 70, some live 80. And last night, I was watching Super Bowl. I found out there was a person in the audience was 95 years old. That was coach's mother. And I say, how long are you going to live? That's all determined by God. But there is a limit to the grace. There is a limit, but it is a character of God. That is patience, mercy, forgiveness, compassion. Those are expressed because those who are suffering through their sinful nature, God is still hoping as a compassionate, merciful God that they will come to the full repentance. Now, verse 10. After he stated the eternity time and also revealed God's character, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and the everything done in it will be laid bare. Now, look at that verse. And he said what? The day of the Lord will come like a thief. That gives the impression the day is when Christ appeared here on the earth. Agreed? He said he's going to come like a thief. That means Christ is going to appear unexpectedly in a time where nobody was waiting. The, the thieves will come. Unless you are home alone movie watches, watchers, you will see they know exactly nine o'clock that night they're going to return and 
rob their house. But that's not what he said. But the most cases, the thieves will not announce. We're coming to rob you. That is only a characteristic of the unexpected time a thief will come. And he says, the Lord will come. Now, I want you to skip that. Look at verse 11, 12. As you look forward to the, what does it say there? To the day of God. Now, question is, is the day of the Lord and the day of God, are they the same? You have to come back next week for that because we're going to look at it and see there is a distinction Peter is drawing here. I want you to see that. However, he is now describing the day of the Lord. So one could say, okay, the day of the Lord, Christ will come as a thief in the night, the heavens, and most uh, believers come to this agreement, which is Christ is ready to come. When he comes, he comes in two stages. Stage one, Christ will appear in the sky and all the believers, those who are dead in Christ and those which are alive will caught up and meet the Lord in the air, which we are commonly referred to as the rapture. But we stay there for seven years or three and a half years or whatever the time you have determined in your mind. That long period of time of tribulation goes on on this earth. Then at the end of that, Christ will literally come to the earth and his feet will touch down here on the earth. But at that time, you notice what is going to happen. The heavens will disappear like a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. I want you to see, now that is a description of at the end of the millennial period, or somebody could say that is the end of the seven-year tribulation period. You have to look at Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. I'll, I'll, uh, verse 12. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. Sun turned black like a sackcloth made of a goat hair. The whole moon turned to blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as the figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. The sixth, sixth seal opened. The judgment of the Lord is coming upon. There's going to be fire. The stars will be formed. And the moon, moon will turn into blood. The sun will turn into darkness. Complete darkness going to come and take place. The destruction is going to come. Every element is going to be destroyed and disappeared. The atoms, the neutrons, the protons, the electrons, they will all disappear. And I tell you, it is not made by any human hands. It is not like an A-bomb is created by somebody else. But I tell you, it is not a human effort of the consumption of this world, this cosmos, by fire. It is by the divine intervention of God, and you begin to see the mighty hand of God is going to come upon. So he's saying, at the time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he said, 
there will be fire coming and everything will be, every element will be destroyed. That's what exactly going to happen at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in the midst of all this, the believers have hope because somehow, some way, God will deliver his people from all this calamity so we can rejoice in the goodness and the mercy of God because he is going to look out for all the believers. Amen. And I'll continue this a little more because I did show you, show you verse 12. What? The day of God. What does that mean to us? The rest of the verses give us the implication if Christ is coming and everything will be disappeared, all the fire is done, then I'm telling you, God's day is going to come for the righteousness to live happily ever after. Amen. Thank you for your patience. Thanks for being here. Thank you for listening. God bless you. Looking forward to see you next week. Amen.